Welcome to the Tabletop Gaming Guild podcast, a podcast all about the experiences and memories that playing games with friends and families can create. And on this episode, we're actually going to be interviewing a good friend of mine, Dave Schnur, who's going to be talking with us about CosCon, a local gaming convention that has been happening in the Butler, Pennsylvania area for quite some time. And uh, Dave, go ahead and just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, basically, I'm retired now. Used to be the controller for the Butler County Housing Authority, which gave me a lot of time to, shall we say, play games and have been doing it. Uh, I started gaming in about 75, basically between high school and college. So been doing it for a while. Started the conventions. Uh, I think 85 was our first one that we did. We're on uh, the 30th. This will be the 33rd CauseCon. Obviously, we had a couple of down years with the, the COVID that we haven't done it. So we're trying it again, see if we can get this one to work. It is at the General Butler Vagabonds in Butler and well, basically Lindora. Been there for about six years. Before that, we were at the Days Inn for about about 21 years. I think the first two we did were at BC3, next two were at Slippy Rock, and the next two were in Beaver Falls, and then we moved back basically back to Butler. The convention itself is a little bit of everything. We have uh, the role-playing stuff, do a lot of the Adventures League things. We do a lot of Pathfinder, Starfinder, do a miniatures. We're obviously trying to expand on the board games and kind of go from there. Do a lot for charity. We have charity events at, at all the cons. Raised about almost $90,000 for charity over the length of time we've been doing the conventions that's fantastic Um, and we we do sibcon in september we're in the we just had our 25th of that so we've done about 60 cons give or take over the over the years which is a lot of conventions yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in and be the uh the annoying young guy in the group here real quick you said that coscon was the first one and you started with that and you think you started around 85 85 is when we did the uh the clearview mall bj dalton's and i can't remember the other bookstore asked one of our members if we were interested in uh running some dnd because at the back then dnd was just really starting. The box sets were out, but the gaming books had just really started. And they wanted to obviously push their books, so they kind of asked us to do it, and that's kind of where we started. Circle of Swords came into play because it just happened to be we had eight DMs running eight tables in the middle of the mall. So that was the first one we did. After that, yeah, the first one at uh, BC3 was in, in 88. So we've been running semi-continuously since 1988. I was just going to say, so I am the same age as Shut your... <laughs> I agree. I was also Shut up, Peter. <laughs> I I was also born in eighty five. What? Yeah. I, I I will say that I can relate to that statement. Evan, you can relate to that statement. I didn't know you were in eighty five as well. Yeah, June of eighty five. Oh, look at us just hanging out with these old fogies over here. Yeah. See, I was June of eight. I was June, but mine was fifty seven. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's I think it's awesome that Butler has this really long history of being a gaming community and and encouraging the gaming community. So I think I just think that's fantastic. Uh, I kind of lucked out when I moved to this area to getting connected with a few of the guys from the group uh, who participated in in the conventions, because before before coming to the area, I, you know, I played games with friends every so often and I liked board games, but I had never really lived in an area that loved games and tr- and like so many different people in this area even though they're not all connected yet still somehow so many people in this area really love games and are very like outspoken about it so i love that that was something that uh that i kind of just happenstance moved into i think that i actually think that has to do a lot with circles of swords the fact that you had those conventions and developed a community through all those years made the people of Butler find enjoyment in gaming. You can go, I've gone to a lot of other places and those people that would probably love the gaming, there's no community there because they didn't have like a place to meet and a place to to, uh, play these games and to enjoy the company of others. So I think that the community that you like in in Butler, Peter, is largely attributed to the work that Circle of Swords has done. Thanks, I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. And and, and it's well known that people talk um about the convention that have gone to it my first one was over at the days in a buddy of mine alex uh he brought me down we were living up in um franklin area so i mean not that far away but he took classes at like bc3 and that and he knew um a bunch of people that ran stuff and participated in there and once we got to be friends and stuff like that and discovered we had mutual interest in D and stuff like that he said well why don't you come down there's this convention that happens down there and that was the first one that i ever got to go to before that i mean there was one gaming shop that could go to here and there 
there, but it was more for playing like magic and stuff like that. But it wasn't really made for like playing board games or for playing D and D. So I was stuck to trying to find my own groups for doing that. And it was nice to find a place that even if only once twice a year have the ability to do that. As I said, I've had fun doing it. So, and as I said, I'm going to be 65 and I'm still doing it. So I guess I liked it a little bit more than I probably should have. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you were talking about the uh, Liquor View Mar and having it near the bookstore and stuff like that. But was there any like other attributing factors that got you guys started in doing these convections where you just like did that one and you're like, this is awesome. Let's keep doing it. Or what got you going? We'll call it peer pressure. Yeah. Kind of what really happened at the beginning is uh, I actually wasn't the one that the bookstore approached. It was one of our members and he asked if I would help him. And, you know, obviously was stupid said yes. And the next thing that happened was he got a job in West Virginia right after that. So it was like, okay, you can handle this now. I'll, you know, I'll come up for the con. You handle everything. He's thanks. Yeah, it was basically that. And after that, it was like, you know, you found friends and stuff like that who were interested. And as I said, we, a lot of us were at BC3 or just left BC3 kind of a thing. So it was like, we just kind of fell into it. And to be honest with you, it's at the point now that we don't have a board meeting and say, are we going to have CostCon? It's like, well, CostCon's in March, you know, get ready. So it's more along the lines now we've done it for so long. I hate to say it's expected, but, you know, we kind of feel it almost is. I get so much feedback from people of, you know, I haven't played since like 95, but, you know, I still remember when this, 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 and this happened at the con, that kind of thing. And we've had some, in the early days, we had a lot of guests. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Jean Raby. She used to, she's basically a big author now. She does a lot of books. Back then, she was the head of the RPGA, and we came here for a guest and sure she came as one of our guests and to me that was the highest compliment I got was we had probably six kids between probably 12 and 14 that you know at the time we were hurting for DMs and they were DMing and she just complimented that they were some of the best DMs she's ever had it was like you know I can take semi credit for that because I'm the one, <laughs> I'm the one that you know taught them all the bad habits so they just decided what not to do and you know, ran good games. And that was actually bringing the next generation up is, you know, let's face it, what we have to do. And I can, I can attest they're continuing to do that because I mean, that that's how I got my start in DMing as well. I, you know, we're working here in Butler and meeting Ron Rummel, who is a, another individual who is, who has done a lot in the games and, uh, and Ron introducing me to Dave and uh, Sibcon is where I played my first game of Dungeons and Dragons. And so Sibcon, like Dave said earlier, happens every September. And then Coscon happens in March. So between September being the first time I ever played to being March being the first time I ever ran a game. So I, I very quickly felt comfortable learning how to play the game with these awesome guys and then being given the opportunity like, hey, now go run a game because that's what you do. Like you, you play the game, you learn the game. And if you like it, you are quickly an apologist for the game and you go out there and you start showing other people how to play. And I can say in my six years now, yeah, about six years that I've been playing, I know that I have got, I believe, at least three people that I have also got DMing now games. And so, you know, like Dave said, it's it's all about that helping out the next generation, helping out, you know, it's just the way, and it's, you know, and it's the same thing of getting on to this podcast and talking with James and Dan and Evan and Nathan. Now I play so many more board games and I, and I'm falling in love with that hobby. So uh, it's a great hobby to be part of with a lot of really great people. So CosCon and SibCon is a huge part of that for me. Well, all you youngsters should uh, appreciate what us old folks did to bring the game into play. When we, when I first started, it was, uh, shall we say we hid in the cabinets. It was like, you, you couldn't admit that you were playing that. So you made excuses of, Oh, it's still, it's basically like a board game or, you know, it's like chess or something like that. And to know what it is now, it's, uh, you know, let's face it, major actors now are saying how they play video games and they play role-playing games and stuff like that, where when we started in the 70s, it was the, shall we say, the, you know, Satan's coming to get you if you play these kind of games. So right. it's, it's come a long way and I think it's it's done good. So as a side note, since you went through the whole years and through, through all the editions of D&D and stuff, when do you think what the cultural turning point was that, it became like acceptable not that it isn't an acceptable game just like when the the culture 
was like, yeah, this is really cool instead of why are you doing this? I think when we first started, the nerds had to grow up. And as soon as the nerds grew up, they became heads of CEOs of different companies and they, they brought their games with them. So it became, we're running the world now kind of a thing. And, you know, if we enjoy this and you don't, well, that's your problem. We're still going to do it. And I think that's kind of where it went. There, there wasn't as many nerds around in the 70s as there is. Well, if they were, they were hiding under the blanket kind of a thing. Where now it's, you know, it's mainstream. They even have what, D&D gummy bears now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think the big thing is, is to remember, like, there's always, you know, there's always been nerds about something. So, you you, you know, you always have people who, who nerd out or geek out over being out in nature. And it's just, this is just another awesome hobby that some people really get into. And, and I think that it's, I think that, that it's a fantastic thing knowing that, yeah, I can be any age and love playing games and that not be a weird thing. It is, it is just another really cool hobby uh, out of all the hobbies that are available to everybody to be a part of. And again, I, I just, I love, I personally love this hobby because it's all about being around other people and enjoying yourselves. Some hobbies are about being on your own, doing your own thing. And and that's awesome too. It's just, that's not my personality. So I love that I found gaming because for me, gaming is being with people. And sometimes the game is almost secondary. Uh, unless you're playing James, the game is very important and you have to beat him. <laughs> yeah, they have to beat me for some reason. Abs- <laughs> everybody has to, you know, I don't care who else wins. We just have to beat James. Now you just I, have the face that someone needs to beat. How's that? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so I, I agree with Dave. I think that, it was that generation growing up that made it possible. But it's also because our generation, not these young children, yep. but our generation is like the generation of the information age where information was becoming available. And before us, information was very hard. And it generally came from extremely filtered sources. So it was hard to say, like, to be an individual and express your opinions and have like people listen and now it's super easy it's probably too easy but i think yeah i agree i think we grew up we love the hobby we have the ability to show other people how it's awesome and it's easy to express that so yeah a variation a question that james asked so as you said earlier um you you've gotten to the point that you don't have the board meetings anymore to discuss you know is this convention happening but more so of prepared because it's going to happen about when did that happen like really like when did you figure out this is a hit and this is going to be what we're going to be doing at these times a year like you knew that it was just we don't have to plan for this anymore it's just it's going to happen i think it just kind of how can I say it? Snuck up and slapped you in the back of the head. Uh, I don't really think it was a, a conscious decision. It was just, that's what we do, you know, kind of a thing. It, it got to the point where cost cons, the only reason we have it changes a little bit in March is because of daylight savings time. We had one con that was daylight savings times weekend and it was a disaster. So that's why we have two different weekends in March. And then September is because of St. Patrick's Day, basically work around that in the two weekends. And it was just, I think it just, it just kind of grew. And I've been lucky that we've had the same people in the club because that's why like, like a lot of college clubs that used to run conventions. That's why a lot of those aren't around anymore is, you know, you'd have, have a set of, set of people for maybe one or two years in their you know junior senior year, then they graduated and left, and you didn't always have the people following up from that. Where I'm lucky enough that I have really the same people running the reg desk. A lot of people, you know, I, I do more at the con than I do before then. Kurt Rauschenberger and uh, Lucas Kelly are the two of our board members, and they do 95% of the work before the con. I basically just uh, you know try to break arms to get people to DM, which is still always going to be the hardest part of a con is to get enough people willing to you know, to DM stuff, which is why Peter's shoulders are always sore twice a year. As I said, I really don't think it was a conscious thing. It was just, it just grew to where you didn't think about it anymore. I don't know if that answers ima- the question. I imagine once it hit CostCon 10 or 15, you were <laughs> yeah. probably in your stride. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh-oh. Yeah, that, that did answer it. I mean, it sounds pretty much you. You gave birth to this thing and it just took off right from there. Yeah. Which is really, I mean, anytime you want to try and invent something like this, so to speak, you want it to do. And people appreciate it and they let you know that they appreciate it, where the, sometimes you do stuff and let's face it, all you hear is the, the negatives. You don't hear any positives. This has been fairly well of, you know, you know, thanks for the good weekend that kind of stuff. You know, obviously we're going to have the one or two people that they're never going to be happy no matter what. But uh, as, as a group, uh, the role players and the, you know, the gamers are pretty nice guys. As I said, we've been doing what, 60 plus cons. I'm sure we've had theft at our cons, but we've only had one major theft. 
And that was like in year three or four kind of a thing. So it's like you got honest people who enjoy playing. What else can you really ask for? So um, I, you brought up something a moment ago, and it was that kind of, again, that whole thing about the generations and how long the convention and the the group itself, the the club, uh, Circle of Swords, has been around. I guess my it, maybe it's kind of a heavy question. But it's one that I, I'm interested in is where do you see the club Circle of Swords going forward? Like, what is your the makeup of the group looking like going forward in into more years? Definitely got to get some some newer blood on the board, you know, helping at the cons, that kind of thing. As I said, I was the controller of the housing authority. I, I can I can organize anything. I, mm-hmm. you know, let's face it, I can organize the hell out of anything. And so it was easy for me to do the cons just because that's the way my, my brain works. But as I said, I'm getting older. We need people to follow up and kind of do that thing. So I mean, we've been lucky with really everybody will pitch in when you ask them to, but you, you've got to ask them to. And right. right now, I don't really have anybody that I think wants to take over. Okay. You know, that kind of a thing. But you're looking. You're looking for those people who, who hopefully will step up. Yes. It's just right now with the whole COVID stuff, it's – yeah. Uh, I've, I've lost three years. It, you know, right. There's no other way to phrase it, you know, which I'm sure all of you have too. You've, you've not gone to the places that you wanted to go to. You haven't gone to the cons. I mean, I've been to probably two or 300 cons in my lifetime. Always go to Origins, always go to Gen Con, all that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. just, well, number one, I'm getting old enough now that I really can't because to be honest with you, the walking just kills my knees when you go to a, you know, a major convention. Right. So I like the little, I, I always like the little ones better because they, they have a personality where the big ones don't really have a personality. You know, we're considered to be more of like a family con. You know, you can bring the kids and you're not going to, I mean, I still, I still howl at the last con when they brought out the little baby, uh, the, the baby playpen next to the role playing stuff that, <laughs> that, that, that pleased me to so so much it was unbelievable that was just so funny and it was like you can't ask for more than that yeah i mean it's it's really nice i mean having having only really been to one big convention and and now seeing coscon and sibcon in that light i mean you know you, you go and maybe you get your hotel room or like us we have friends who who come from across the state who actually will stay at our house to come to coscon and because we live close enough to to it but you get there and it's just one big room it's one big room everything gets sectioned off for the play but like dave says it's it, it feels small and like a family con because everybody's right there together and i if i remember correctly i think by the end of one of the weekends you usually have somewhere north of 300 people who've participated right dave yes normally i mean Pre- i think pre-COVID. that's fantastic yeah i think yeah. that's fantastic in the the heyday of the some of you might remember they, they used to do there was an adventurous league there was living city when the Living City was big, we would have almost 500 at the con, which is why we had it at the Days In. The only problem with the Days In, we just got priced out there. This is why we moved to the Vagabonds, which to me was nice because the food's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, food's food's better, and now also sad to say, Days In is no longer True. open. It is now closed. Right. So I also think that Coscon is a generational convention too, because a lot of people that have went there for a very long time, it's every time I see it, there's they bring all their kids, and their kids are playing. So I I really think that that's amazing too. Yeah, I find that interesting. I'm running a semi regular Sunday game, and it's basically three fathers and the three kids, and the kids range are basically 13, give or take a year. So that's a whole other experience running for a parent <laughs> and a 13 year old. <laughs> I love that. I think that's awesome. Yeah, I run one with, uh, you know, Peter and that, and we, I do some stuff on Saturdays and nothing exhausts me more than Sunday night when that game is over. It's like my brain is so scrambled eggs. It's not even funny, which is fun. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've run for, uh, for quite a few t- teenagers at this point, but I've never run for teenagers and their parents. And yeah, mm-hmm. I can only imagine the, the dad's being embarrassed and the kid's not caring. It's, it's, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> So, uh, so Dan, one of our other hosts here on on the podcast, Dan is, uh, as we've mentioned on the show before, works for New Dimension Comics, and I know New Dimensions comes to the conventions as well as as one of the tables and one of the sellers. So, Dan, what is your experience with Coscon and Sibcon as that side of things? Well, uh, sadly, I don't have a heck of a lot to say on this topic because uh, <laughs> the other people that work for the company are obviously the ones that steal the the vending seat from me. 
I keep on telling them, please, dear God, send me. These are my people. But the, they, nobody listens. Nobody listens. Tony I, just <laughs> Tony taking the good seat every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And before it was Mike, I, I don't know what to tell you. I will have you give you a small tidbit from from my heyday. Circle of Swords was actually one of the very first gaming conventions that I went to while I was still attending university at, at Bloomsburg in Pennsylvania. A group of us decided to come out here. One of our roommates, we had a, you know, four, four person flat was from this area and we came to Coscon to check it out and to play games there totally before there was any inkling that I would end up in this area. And then approximately when I moved into the area, which was 13 or 15 years ago now, you know, I, I reconnected with the group and I attended a couple shows and I remember running a couple sessions before my life got an infinitely more complicated. That's cool. I, I had no idea. Again, that's that's a new story for me. I had no idea that you had a connection with CosCon and, and Circle of Swords going back that far. And I didn't realize that you've only been in the Butler area for around 13, 13, 14 years. It's about the same amount of time as myself. Yeah, I, I could be off slightly there, but yeah. So yeah, no. Another, you know, story for the convention wise there, like, as I said earlier, was uh, I got to play some D&D there from a long time ago when I lived in Franklin, Mo City. Um, and I moved down here where I am now in Catanning about eight years ago and hadn't been playing much D&D and much really doing much really gaming wise. I just kind of fell out of the hobby for a little while. And I looked to try and find something to do again, trying to get back into it. And the opportunity, as I saw, was still going on. I decided to sign up and try it out. And one thing that always had an interest for me was military history. And there was a good collection of miniature games gamers that was there. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. And I haven't looked back since. That is one thing that I will say is actually phenomenal for being a smaller con is the amount of different games that are being run there at any given time. If you want to try something, there's a chance there's going to be something there or something close to it that you can give it a try. And you might find that you have a passion and a hobby that you didn't know you had before. All it's going to take is four hours of your time to give it a try. Yeah, to me, that was the reason to go to conventions is to game with people you haven't game with before and to play games that you never played before because i used to do that for you know like a new role-playing game would come out well i don't know the rules let's go to a convention play a couple rounds of that particular game and learn the basics of that rule set and i think that's where why i play as many games as i do i probably play i'd say at least six to eight different role-playing games you know at different times and rules are semi the same to totally different well it's like anything else you can get bored with something where you know at least take a break from it and do something else it kind of revives you for the rest of it Two questions for you on TTRPG games. What is your favorite one to run first? You role-playing games? Yes. Is that what you said? Probably still D&D, just because okay. I've done it for so long. I mean, I used to I used to run 10 to 12 rounds when I used to go to Gen Con way back in the you know, 80s and 90s. And I still think I'd, I'm, I think I'm better at that because I'm, I'm more of a role player than a, than an R-U-L-E player. I hate it when rules get, if a rule bogs down a game, get rid of it. I've always been that philosophy. And I really have one goal and that's you're in my hands for four hours. All I want to do is make sure you have a great time. And that's that's my job as a DM is to, you know, I've, I've played games before where I don't think I've done things for five minutes as a DM because you, know, you throw something out and people were doing, you know, role playing between themselves or doing stuff between themselves and having a good time. I don't need to be there. You know, I don't need to help. But then it slows down, you pick it up and you go. And as I said, as long as you're having a good time for four hours, I don't care about the rules. You know, I've always kind of been that kind of a player. Very What's game. your favorite edition of d d uh, Can you remember the differences <laughs> enough, Dave, to tell us your favorite edition? <laughs> uh, way, way back when, probably second edition, because that's where all the Living City things were. And to be honest with you, back then, you know, I grew up with the rules. So it wasn't that I, I picked, you know, like you pick up a fifth edition book. Okay, what are the rules changes? Well, I didn't have that with second edition because that's what I was brought up on. And I think that was the best time I ever had was then. But definitely second and fifth. You can, well, one was not bad. But three and four, eh, never mind. <laughs> three and four don't exist. So like the Highlander movies, there's only one. <laughs> The other ones don't count. What was your favorite RPG to play? Not DM, but play. What would you find? What was the one that you found that stimulated you the most? Probably Star Wars. Or, oh, the, the D6 yeah. one or the D20? Well, we started with the six. We're now playing the 20 and I do the I did the 20. It's just, I, I, I like it. It's just, yeah. it's something different and that kind of thing. I mean, I'm just starting Stargate. The new Stargate just came out oh. and, and I finally got that. So I 
we I DM'd it once on Saturday. It's, you know, it's different. Still fifth yeah. edition, but a lot of changes. So we'll see what happens. All those. And if you're really in a bad mood, you play Paranoia with your six characters and you see how you can <laughs> you kill everybody that you can kill just because you're mad at them for whatever. So that's the, when there's tension at the game, at, at the table, then just run Paranoia and that gets over pretty quick. I'd love <laughs> to play Paranoia sometime. <laughs> you, you can't I've, take I've, that game seriously. It I've seen, so, I've so seen much it. Fun. I've seen it played a little bit. I would love to play it. It looks so much yep. fun. I just go in with a thick skin. <laughs> <laughs> so being someone that's been to so many different conventions, as you said, what's one game that you've gotten to play and that's been very memorable for you? One that not one that you necessarily, you know, kept playing, but just it's, it sticks out in, in your mind. It's hard you're saying as a player. Yeah, as a player. That's kind of hard for me only because I, you know, early I used to be the regional director for the RPGA, which means I went to all these conventions and I ran. So I never really played that many games, probably a couple of living cities way back when, because when I first started, there wasn't any, uh, well, the modules when I really first started playing were, here's the module, here's the six pre-roll characters, pick which one you're playing. So it was more of a straight role playing. You know, there was as much written on how you get along with the other players or the other characters as it was, you know, these are your stats. I think my most memorable though were, were from DMing more than, than it was from playing. I, I still remember my, my favorite, which made me really, really proud was, I was running at Gen Con and ran the game. Guy comes up to me and goes, you know, do, do, do you normally DM? And I go, well, yeah, I enjoy DM. And he goes, yeah, I know it shows. Can't get a better compliment than that. As a yeah. DM. So that was probably my favorite comment. I'll phrase it that way. But be honest with you, they've, I've probably run three or 400 different modules. So it's kind of everything kind of blends, especially the older you get. <laughs> Everything definitely blends into one. You know, you put it in the blender and that's where it goes. Can't really answer your question, I guess. I have a more important question. Now that we're talking about the RPGs, we can talk about the more important topic. Like, okay, what is your favorite board game? Oh, no, no doubt about it. Risk. Risk? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yep. Used to play it in college. And be honest with you, if there wasn't blood on the table when the game was over, yeah. it wasn't a good game. <laughs> Yeah, risk, <laughs> risk is a super frustrating game. Oh, no, because it's, you know, you get your roommates, you get a couple beers involved. It was in made for good. Oh, and after man. that, probably Axis and Allies. They're probably be my, yeah, my two favorite. I played so much Axis and Allies when I was a kid. So yeah. much. We played back to back, like days on end. I kind of uh, missed the, the chit game era. So I was never uh, really big into the chit games where a lot of my friends. When I first started, it was basically with kind of the Peter to me generational shift. That's where they started was, you know, the military chit games, the the Third Reich and all that kind of stuff. I was, I don't want to sit down and play a game for 96 hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can tell you, GMT is still keeping that alive. So yeah, if you want to get a chit game, you can get one from them. Oh, I still have chit games upstairs. So it's like one of those, but it's just, you know, Risk is definitely going to be number one board game wise. That and Dark Tower. And, you know, you have to like Dark Tower. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm super excited to play the new version of Dark Tower. I was until that you had to have your phone in an app. And then that oh, you do? You? On it. I, yeah. yeah, I didn't know that part. I knew they make that tower and I didn't I didn't yep. know the tower didn't do everything. Because the original Dark Tower one did. Yeah, I know. Well, I, I have a couple upstairs. I just I love that. I have, I have a few games upstairs. I, Peter will attest to that. Yeah, he's he has he has a couple thousand. Yeah, you got, I used to play a lot of Hero Quest. Did you play that? Uh, yes. Oh I yeah, that's like the game's uh, one. It's it's yeah. probably the worst game ever on the face of the planet because I'm rereading it. I'm like, this is trash. But yeah. I loved the game. I'm like, yeah, you're uh, the main character that you you is called Mentor. Like they couldn't think of names. They could have named them like Fred and it would have been better. I think it's funny is you'll buy miniatures online or something like that. And every time you get them, there'll be that one skeleton in there, that one (laughs) in there. (laughs) There's so many pieces that got thrown into so many different areas. So I've, I've got actually, I've got a question for James right now, actually. Because Dave was talking earlier about the the convention and how, you know, over the years, it's mostly been role playing games and we've had some miniature games happening. But Dave was talking about we'd like to see more board games. So, I mean, I I know that Tabletop Gaming Guild, we have our board game collection. But what are you going to do, James, to try to woo some of these role playing gamers and these miniature gamers over to your board game tables? Well, the, the point is not to woo. Oh, not the to point, The point is, is that we will have hundreds of games that are all free that they can play and I can teach any of them. And the same thing with role-playing games is the same thing with board games. You have to make a community. You have to make people feel invited. You have to have people enjoy the game. And part of enjoying the game is keeping an upbeat attitude and being positive and, and explain the games and 
creating an atmosphere, getting groups together, doing all that work. That's all there is to it. I mean, there's no like special thing. It's just, it's about the people. The board game is just a bunch of cardboard. It's nothing without people playing it. And you got to ask questions and tailor, maybe suggest certain games that you would think would fit with them and stuff. It's all the same. Yeah, what, what do you need from me per se that would help you do that at the convention? Is there anything specifically you'd like from me? No, I mean, if we have two tables to put the games on, it's all free. So if we have somewhere for people to play, I can, they can pick a game and if they want help teaching it, I can teach it or anything we can do to help you guys out is really what we want to do. So if that's something that can help out, bring more people in, have people enjoy the convention, that's what we want to do. Appreciate that. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And um, I know, I know, again, having mostly been doing D&D at the convention, so games are very time slot oriented. You know, you've got four hours, games are going to start at this time. The board games, is that going to be kind of just like open ended as people walk up and want to play something? Or are those also going to be kind of time slotted? You guys, have you guys talked about that? Or I was, I'll do whatever you want, but I was just planning on just not having anything, just being available. And anytime anyone wants to play a game at any time, they can come over out. and play. Okay, does, nice. Does that sound good or do you want time slots? You you might want to schedule some games. I find a lot of people won't ask. You okay. know, they want to they do something, but they, they're, they're afraid to ask. It's like they don't want to look stupid. You know, it's like Conquest of the Empire. I don't know what that is, but that really looks cool, but I'm afraid to ask. That kind of mentality can hit. So I don't know if that helps at all. I was going to say, to me, that makes sense. You know, you schedule some specific games at specific times, but in between that, it could be a little bit more open and available. As someone who's had some exposure to some event organization, it definitely helps to enter with a plan. If you enter without a plan, oftentimes the plan flops. So yeah, have your four hour game slots or or two hours, you know, to because most games take about two hours. But if you can find a game that plays in two hours and play it twice, then eh, that's about right. I mean, James, you've got three days. How many games of Twilight Imperium 4th Edition can you get in? <laughs> I, I actually think that that's one I'm, I'm not going to do a time slot for that but i'll probably take the most i'll probably make a list of the most popular games twilight imperium is exactly the kind of game that you want a time slot for you want people to sign up for that advance you want people who are committed it's true it's true and i'll be like here i'm gonna run these games and then for an eight hour slot that's right show up at 8 a.m on saturday and by you know like 4 p.m on saturday we might be done with twilight imperium i can talk to uh the vagabonds making a schedule at like midnight to eight in the morning something like that for you (laughs) oh there you go perfect (laughs) everybody else is everybody else is leaving (laughs) everybody else is leaving but the board game players are ready to get started (laughs) people think those zombie apocalypse happen as they're stumbling out (laughs) yeah no most definitely they'll be stumbling out because they've probably been playing games previously during the other eight hours i, I will say i will um, echo that sentiment um, people will be afraid to ask because i've run a couple miniature games there and i've had people sign up for it and have some slots and then you'll watch the same two or three people circle back around and around and then by the third time it's like hey you, you, you invite them over and then they'll actually play at that point i know at slipper Arcon, i was hunting people down if they started like circling i was like boom <laughs> over there like hey everybody play a game here's a table sit down let's play james, you uh, hold this eye yeah, yeah james you're, you're not doing anything you you need something to do come play a game with me <laughs> pretty yeah. much but yeah I'll, I'll, I'll get you a list of games and we can do four hour slots for them or whatever you want and i'll do it don't run yeah. conventions so i don't know how really how that works yeah. so well we do that. we do use warhorn as our scheduling mechanism okay. so if you decide you want to do something just give me times and i'll basically have luke up, upload the events Uh, you know, that kind of a thing. You're in the weird situation as it is the board game stuff. And there's so many different games out there. It's hard to tell, you know, what people are going to want to play. But uh, if you really like something and, you know, fits in a good time period, because I think what you're going to find is the same thing that happened when we started running these cons. I mean, the role-playing stuff wasn't big, BC3, you know, stuff that just came out. So the other stuff, but if you get to the point where like you're doing this time after time, it's like, oh, we played X game last time and that was great. Let's play that again. And then you'll get this, you'll get repeat players playing different games, and then you can start slipping in the well. If you like this one, you might really like this one. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of a thing. So you do the uh, you know the bait and switch with them two on games, you know that kind of stuff. And so Dave, you actually you mentioned there Warhorn. So we haven't talked about that yet for everybody listening. Is how. How do people sign up? How do they register to either play and or run a game? Okay, you can go straight on to warhorn.net. 
I actually don't remember our specific code, but if you go to warhorn.net, uh, it'll give you a list of conventions. Uh, just go to CauseCon, click on it, and basically you can register right through that, and that'll give you. Do you want you know you want a T-shirt? You want a DM? You want to play? I can only come on Saturday, so you can just get a Saturday pass. All that information then is on Warhorn. Everything goes through PayPal after that, or you can basically owe us money and pay at the con. You know that kind of a thing. Yep, um, and I'll, I've got your back on that. It's Warhorn.net forward slash events forward slash CauseCon dash X. X X I I because it's the 32nd and uh and the logo Dave this year the logo yeah. is fantastic yeah that's actually <laughs> those t-shirts are actually three years old <laughs> Are they really? They were, they were built for the cause of the first cause con we had to cancel because of COVID. Oh man, I, <laughs> that's I why love... we're saying that's that's why we're saying it's said limited quantities this year. <laughs> I, I I love that dragon though. Who, who all did you end up getting to uh, to do the logo for you guys? For Bannix does does that all the time. The uh, the ones that do the he, he normally his son is the one that does all of the uh, the swords, the jewelry, the you know that kind of stuff. Oh, so okay. Infinite Images is the name of the company. George Verbanic is one who acts who's the one who actually does the t-shirts uh he's done really i think all but three i think he started doing him cost con four and has really been doing them ever since oh wow that's that's a nice long history working yeah, which with is the ridiculous group. which is ridiculous how many t-shirts i have in my freaking attic because you know, <laughs> i gotta buy one for each con and keep it <laughs> oh that's awesome yeah, so I think I have like four tubs of T-shirts just from cons. Yeah, if you have four tubs, then you have more T-shirts from con than I have from, <laughs> from New Dimension Comics, which is yeah. a little yeah. scary. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's just my cause con and subcon ones. That doesn't, I'm not counting all my other ones from all the other cons I've gone to. <laughs> Watch Babylon 5, like Babylon 5. Next thing you know, you've got 20 T-shirts of Babylon 5. <laughs> One of those. We'll put the links in the show notes okay. uh, for the convention and Circle of Swords and all that stuff. So if someone didn't catch what Peter was saying, you don't need to right. go backwards and try to figure That's it right. out. We'll, we'll okay. yeah, and, and the and, website's and, circleofswords.com. Yep. And, uh, and if anybody's listening to the show and wants to play a board game, James, obviously we be playing some board games, but I'll also be running some Dungeons and Dragons. So if you if you register, look look for Peter and you can you can play a Dungeons and Dragons game with me. That would be fun. And then I still have to get the couple pieces together here, but me, Evan here, I'll be running a miniature game hopefully as long as all the peep things come in. So I'll be more than happy to run something here with you guys if you want to do that too and i will not be there because i'll be stuck at the store 98 <laughs> percent chance of probability Boo. i'm gonna have words but, for tony but new dimension comics will have a booth we'll have a Yay. thank you if it if it makes you feel better dan i will call you from the convention and heckle you Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah no no comment like this is so awesome we'll text yeah, I you sw- every swing game by- that we're playing <laughs> I can swing by the store on my way there and be like, am I at the right spot or did I get lost? (laughs) Sorry, I got to go to the awesome convention. Have fun, Dan. I'm I'm hireable for heckling too in case. Oh, that's good. We'll do that. (laughs) We like round the clock heckling of Dan and be like, I hate you all. Tony should be able to at least give you a Sunday. I mean, come on. (laughs) Sunday for a (laughs) teardown. Yeah, I guess you'd have to clean up. I don't know that you want to clean up. Now, uh, one thing that you mentioned earlier, you do a lot of charity work for with with these conventions. don't remember if I saw it on this one, but who are you guys helping out the, for this convention? It's kind of weird. This is a weird one. We're still doing the uh, Gatanning Boys Camp. We basically pre when CosCon was canceled originally the first one, the first COVID one. They were our charity there. We didn't want them to wait that long because we weren't sure what the next one was. So we went ahead and paid. We basically donated thirty five hundred dollars to them last CosCon. So there's still the charity this time. We're just kind of recouping, you know, what we already spent. If it comes more than that, we'll basically write another check. But that's great. That you, yeah, that's great that you were able to go ahead and front them that so they didn't have right. to wait for the actual convention to happen. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, we've been lucky enough that we've been doing this for this many years. Being an accountant, you worry about the money. So it was like, well, the, let's face it. The first couple cons, I was nervous because I'm personally front of the money for the first couple cons. So it was like, you just prayed you had enough people that I'd get my money back. But we've run so many cons since then that we've kind of made sure the kitty wise, because we, we, we do run in March. So you can have that one freezing rain weekend, you know, that wipes out the entire con. So we tried to make sure we at least had in the kitty that, you know, if we had two or three bad cons, we still were not going to go bankrupt and still have them. And luckily we really haven't had any of that. So we've, we've built up enough of a kitty that even 
even though we've taken bad hits the, in the last couple of years, we're still good financially. So we can still do this. You know, I'm more afraid for like, you know, like the vagabonds, you know, they count on stuff like what we do and that wasn't available for a couple of years. So I'm surprised they're still open, but you know, let's make sure we keep them going because they definitely have been a great partner for us since we moved. Yeah, absolutely. I was also going to ask, so Circle of Swords is a club in and of itself. Coscon and Sibcon are two conventions that they do. Beyond those conventions, what does Circle of Swords get up to? We basically, we, we are a 501c3. We're actually CF. We're, we're in the same category as the Steelers and the uh, Pirates. Uh, nice. It, what makes it, actually, I was really surprised. The IRS is the one that told us this because when I originally applied for it, he goes, well, you don't want to do that because if you do that, you have to pay taxes Okay, on, on the money you get. So you do this as the F and as long as you do like like things. In other words, you like gaming, you come to a gaming con, we don't have to pay taxes on what you do. You know, So basically, cost cons have been tax-free. Now, if we do something over and above that, you know, we, we sell jewelry or something like that, then that's all you know, taxable just like a regular company. So that's kind of why we did that. Uh, now, umbrella-wise, I say we, we do the two cons. We used to do the monthly gaming. That's going to kind of, shall we say, transfer to the, um, I think it's called the Butler Library. You know, that they kind of <laughs> do some quarterly we, stuff. So We still do quarterly to, games. Yeah, we're, we're going to try to, you know, keep that as our monthly part of the game. We do do a live-action LARP, which is a medieval LARP called Quest. Well, Quest, you know, COS Quest, actually. We've been doing that since 92. So we probably run another 150, 200 events under that during that period. Uh, obviously, that's been shut down you know, with COVID too. We're hopefully going to start that one back up in May. We used to have a vampire LARP. We, we used to be able to do a lot of different stuff at the days in because there was different rooms available. So we could have live action games at the con, which we really can't have at, at the Vagabonds because you really need you know your own separate room for those kind of games. So we still a group that does the vampire stuff, but really not affiliated with us anymore. So we're really down to the cons and, and the LARP are the biggest thing. And as I said, I would love to get more of the monthly gaming going and, you know, helping you guys out, that kind of a thing. As I said, I'm going to try to be there on Saturday, as long as my roommate doesn't get COVID again. Like he seems like he's getting 16 times in the last week. So, oh, man. Yeah. So, you know, then I have to lock myself away. Right. <laughs> That's really about all we do right now. As I said, we still have, we went up from a seven member board to a five member board just because, you know, we're not doing as much as we did before. Mm -hmm. And as I said, most of it now is it's, it's like the automatic, you know, even if they're not on the board, they're working the reg desk, that kind of thing. As I said, my biggest thing is, you know, I carry a big stick to try to twist as many arms as I can, you know, for DMs. So anyone out there who, who is willing to DM, you're more than going to be liked by me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, <laughs> I can attest to this. Dave loves me because I keep yes. DMing. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. When he found out I couldn't come to the last one, I, I, I almost had to go after him. But yeah, I, I figured he's 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 allowed his one and a. <laughs> I was I was a little I was a little scared and sad at the same time to let Dave know. I I, I thoughtfully, very thoughtfully, yes. let him know from yep. a distance that I would yes. not be there. Yeah, closer to the door because he figured, you know, as fat as I am and as thin as he is, he could outrun me. <laughs> but yeah, we can always use DMs, uh, you know, that kind of a thing. And obviously, any miniatures we can get are, are you know, are more than happy to have those. And obviously, we'd really like to expand on the board games. You guys just do that stuff and we'll be fine. So if any of our listeners are looking to help, then the easiest thing would be to contact you, Dave, to, to get involved into helping them. Yeah, basically do uh, SALDO316 at Hotmail. So it's Saldo316 at Hotmail. Yeah, we'll throw that into the show notes as well so people can get in touch. And as I said, I already have the modules. You know, as soon as I know uh, what people are running and what people have signed up to play, email the, the modules to everybody so they have ahead of time. Nothing's worse than getting a module cold. And and that does not happen at this con. Dave does a great job at getting stuff out to you in time to, to prep and be ready. Anything else I can enlighten you on for my uh, 45 plus years of gaming? <laughs> Is there a game, role-playing or board gaming, that you've always wanted to play but have yet to play? That's a good question. I honestly can't think of one because, you know, that's why I used to go to the conventions. If it was something I really wanted to try out, I went and tried out. I mean, I went to cons, you know, a couple that I, I made. I wasn't playing d and I don't care what else was on the schedule, so I'm not doing that. I'm playing just weird things. You know, that kind of a thing. I still like Shadowrun, but that's kind of died too. That's probably a game that I would like to play again. I don't think it's going to be the sixth edition, I think, is really, shall we say, torpedoed the whole Shadowrun line. That and COVID hit the same time. Yeah. Let's face it, COVID's 
destroyed a lot of games that are out. That's probably the saddest part in a lot of the going to the conventions early on was people come out with these great games, but it takes a year to two years to that game to catch on. And the problem was when it was from a smaller company, by the time it caught on, they were already out of business. And that was probably the saddest part of, you know, that kind of like, I'm probably none of you are familiar with Chill. That's one of my favorite supernatural type of games. And that's what happened to that. It was really big. And then, you know, by the time it really hit at the cons and stuff like that, that it wasn't the company wasn't there to support it anymore, which I think was Pace Setter, I think was the company. And they came out with a lot of different really nice games, but by the time it caught on, they were already gone. That's the sad part, you know, more than anything. Yeah. You know, covered by Hasbro, you're covered. True. Kind of a, yeah. So I got I, two more for you here, real quick. Sure. First one being um, so we talked about like your different board games and different PGs in there. Now have you or were you ever a miniature gamer at any point? I do, but the problem I have with miniature games is I, I like the single figure, single person games. I don't really like the, this troop of four men is 20,000 troops, you know, that kind of thing. I think the main reason because I, I have a short attention span. I want to play a game in like the four hour range, give or take. My brother used to do the Civil War games and he would do the whole whole setup and that'd be an eight to 12 hour game. And normally you play for eight or 12 hours and you might get in six or seven moves just because there's so many troops to move. And the, those games I don't really like, but a lot of the, the one-on-ones, like a, really a lot of the, uh, like the zombie games now, you know, I like those. There's Scottish one, there's Vikings ones that, you know, one figure is one figure. Th- those kind of games I do like. The other one I have is maybe you can settle something from a recent podcast we had. So Peter had put on his top 10 games, number one being Dungeons and Dragons. James heckled him repeatedly for about 10, 15 minutes. Could you could you support or would you go against Peter putting Dungeons and Dragons as his number one game? Would you say that that would be somebody's top game? Well, I like Peter. I don't know James enough to really say, but yeah, James is wrong. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. Wrong that's right, wrong James. Person. You're wrong. wrong person. You're wrong, I James. I support this. James is always wrong. Yes. And just remember, you're not running for me. Peter is. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. See? Look. No. Not that I'm self-serving or anything. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just good, honest truth is what it is. Three. Approximation close to it. Okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, James is doing the editing, so this is all gone. Okay, yeah, well, actually, <laughs> I'll just take what you said earlier at a certain point where you said board games at one point and yeah. I'll be like, no, yeah. it's board games. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make sure there's a big pause. <laughs> yeah, we'll say that. The only thing I don't like is card games. You know, like magic and stuff like that. I do not like playing those. You know, the Pokemon's, the magic. Mainly because way back when I could have made I could have made a mint when I was the regional director for the RPGA, they came up to me and basically all these alpha magic cards and goes, you know, can you run some of these at the conventions you go to? And I went, why the hell would I want to play a card game? (laughs) He has, he has regrets people. He has regrets. Yeah. Yeah, There's probably like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in the boxes they were going to give me now. (laughs) I was like, nah, he'd be stupid enough to play a card game. (laughs) (laughs) Dan's devastated in the corner. (laughs) Well, he probably made the money from playing it, from buying and selling the cards. Not as much as you would think. I I only, (laughs) I only started uh, organizing tournaments like uh, five or six years ago. Yeah, mine was a few more years before that. Yeah, now, <laughs> if, if, if you want a heart attack, we were, we, were, we were discussing the current going rate for a black box version of Glory to Rome earlier. Uh, yeah. If you want a real heart attack, <laughs> eBay, eBay a sealed box of alpha Magic Gathering cards. That'll give you a real heart attack. Yep, can't disagree with you on that. Missed opportunity from a guy who supposedly knows finances. Yeah, I can't touch magic cards anymore yeah, okay. yeah. i just spent so much money on it yeah. and i'll go right back it's just like it's like a drug addiction like i gotta yeah. stay away from it i yeah. see it it looks all cool it's like <laughs> oh what no walk away go to the board games walk away yes don't look yep. at it. yeah yeah they yes. tried they tried 100%. really they tried really hard recently when they released their uh their dungeons and dragons sets for magic they, they tried really really hard well they were like "Ooh, there's peter over there we're uh, gonna get him <laughs> yeah it was it was very very close the, the art on those cards is phenomenal i know oh, that i will give you i was looking at the little 10 cent magic cards and i had to walk away because i seen them and i was like i'm gonna get some nope nope not gonna touch them <laughs> first one's always free <laughs> yeah. first one's up. <laughs> like here and it's like it's true too because a lot of times or in the past they did uh game days where they would give you starter pack or some decks all free yeah. as long as you participated so yeah it's a whole these are free they're yep. cool you could get more come see your local dealer dan that yep 
NDC and, you know, he'll, he'll hook you up. I like, will in fact hook you up and I will encourage your hobbies, whatever they may be. <laughs> I mean, hobbies, not, not addictions, hobbies, definitely. Yep. You know, you, you'll be bringing your lunch money in there. He won't feel bad one bit. Well, at least you need to do it in the alley in the rain in the back kind of thing. You know? That's where the beta cards get. <laughs> crazy. True. Well, I am, I just know for one, I am very excited to, to get back to the con. Me too. The last couple of years have been devastating with COVID and not having them. Well, I really paid for it at SIPCON because it's old enough now that, you know, shall we say things don't work the well as they used to. And it's like, I used to be in shape for the cons. And then it was like, you take the two and a half years off. And then it was like, hey, this is actually work now. <laughs> So hopefully we'll get back in the swing of things and things will go good. As I said, hope everyone who comes has a good time and that's all you can hope for. Thank you, Dave, for uh, you. sharing about the different conventions, CosCon and SipCon and uh, Circle of Swords in general. It was really great having you on. I appreciate you asking. Thank you for listening. If you have any feedback for us, feel free to visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or Board Game Geek Guild 2989, or our website at tabletopgamingguild.com. Don't forget to like, follow, and or subscribe. Tabletop Gaming Guild is a product of Tabletop Gaming Guild LLC. All rights reserved.